everybody. You're listening to Currency a Discourse podcast with myself, whatever whatever my name is currently, <laughs> and Quaid. And uh, I think I think we're probably going to get into talking a little bit about scientific literacy or illiteracy um, in the government, and we're just going to kind of see where it goes from there. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. So one thing that's on the radar is Trump's claim that windmills cause cancer the sound from windmills to be like as specific as possible right <clears throat> and that's like been my biggest critique of him um because everybody gets into other things we can talk about like the russia investigation or whatever but what's always worried me is his inability to think about scientific topics or to rationalize around them you know he mm-hmm. ends up disagreeing with a majority of people who actually do the studying and it's been talked about like pretty commonly um, in scientific circles. It's become more popular to talk about people who think that they, because because they have Google search or because they trust a certain person that says something that that is good enough to replace the mounds of data yeah, in any me. given field. <laughs> is that you? Yeah, I can be that guy sometimes. <clears throat> uh, I really try not to be that guy. And I really think that... Um, There's a new podcast that I got into called Why We Argue, and um, he's been talking a lot about he he does essentially what I want to try to do, which is, you know, he brings people on. He talks about the problem with our discourse. And I think that uh, and and then the the foundation that he works through is called the Foundation for Humility and Conviction. That's Mm -hmm. what it's called. Humility and Conviction. Um and it's really good. It's a, it's a great podcast, but just even the title, Humility and Conviction, right? The fact that we're not like humble enough about stuff and to try to... My biggest issue isn't that I make claims that are counter to experts. It's that I make claims about things that experts don't necessarily have a consensus on mm-hmm. and because it becomes really hard to know how to think around issues when you don't have all the data, essentially. And to feel like you do have all the data because you've done, let's say, let's say a day of research, Mm -hmm. a whole day. Well, people are always going to take like the the easiest path towards information, though, right? I mean, so, you know, you and I were at the age where we grew up in a world without access to every bit of information. And now we have it. And, you know, it's isn't it almost better now that we have um people are at least searching for information. They Mm -hmm. take the easiest path and maybe they find, you know, whatever information they come across. But, um, it's almost, I mean, it's just like the natural progression of things. It's just like you find yourself looking for things that you're curious about. Yeah. You find that information and then, but then you feel like you're an expert in it just because Mm -hmm. you've done some initial research. And, uh, like on the one hand, I don't think this has ever been a problem. Or on the you hear people say that like this issue this wasn't an issue thirty years ago it wasn't where people were like heavily disagreeing with like astronauts doubting whether or not we went to the moon these things weren't issues so the idea is that Google might have made that worse because it makes us all feel really smart mm-hmm. uh, when that's just not an adequate form of research for any one topic you know sure. it's good for initial research to get like background information but it's really not good in terms of trying to make specific claims about certain things are we just more suspicious instead of more well-informed now like we know just enough to be (laughs) suspicious about everything but not know not know enough to figure out what's really going on people have said that and i think it's it's that's just one side of it one is that we are we're we end up being suspicious of people who are experts so that's one thing right we feel like we're informed so you can't tell us now right and that's not humility that's not being humble that's Mm. really not it it takes a certain amount of humility to say, I don't know. And you probably know more because you've done in the same way that you go to work every day for eight hours a day. That's what that person does every day. So whatever you're doing and you feel like you're proficient in, that's what that person does for a life. You can't possibly compete with that unless you don't have a job and you're doing what they're doing, which would make you an expert at that point. You feel like um, <clears throat> being humble is a, a required trait for people in 
particularly in scientific fields. It is. Yeah, it really is. And it doesn't feel like it sometimes because the way some of them talk. But for instance, this is a perfect example. So I was listening to Joe Rogan and it just, it drives me nuts listening to these things because there's so, there's a lack of communication that is easily, easily resolved. So they're talking about, um, vaccines. So he has, he has, um, I can't remember what the guy's name is, but he's a, he's obviously a professor, uh, he's, he he re- he wrote a study on <clears throat> um, parasites in tropical areas. I don't know if you. Heard I know that. all about parasites in tropical <laughs> areas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you Not in the some, way that he knows, though. Yeah, yeah. You have some experience with that. Um, but so they start talking about vaccines, and he's talking about how <clears throat> Joe Rogan brings up this friend who um, he knows. They're basically, I'm, I might get the disease wrong, but the, the, the narrative is that the father got a vaccine or somebody in the family got a vaccine mm-hmm. and then they got like Lyme disease. I can't remember if it was Lyme disease, but it was some type of disease. Right. And the whole family is convinced that that came from the vaccine, that the disease came from the vaccine, right? That the disease came from the vaccine. And, mm-hmm. and, and the expert who knows a lot about vaccines is like, probably not. You know, because yeah. he understands the mechanism. And then so Joe Rogan's like, you know, a lot of people are going to be listening to this and they're going to hear you say probably. And it's just like he can't say probably, you know, I wonder if this is why it stops right here. Dude, I think you just figured it out. I did. All right. Um, For those of you listening, we just solved an audio visual visual problem that was yeah. extremely simple that we've been trying to figure out. Yeah. So, uh <laughs> I know the experts told us not to talk about our podcasting oh, yeah. problems. Well, that's a solution. So now, now it's yeah. not going to sound like it was automatically we like made a disrupted. discovery today. Yeah. Dis- when I say we, I mean quite it. <laughs> we'll see. So I, th- I think I just that's ob- it. observed the observation. But um, so yeah, so he, <clears throat> so the family thinks that, and so the doctor's like, probably not. You know. Yeah. And, and so Joe Rogan's like, well, what do you mean probably? And so like the expert can't even use the word probably. And what people don't understand is that's a very common thing to do in academia. He's just being an academic because academics never give absolute certainty. They rarely do that. You want to be really careful because if you say something with absolute certainty and somebody else knows another way to interpret that information, you're fucked. You have now given you you've now uh, over asserted yourself. Scientific language is still not crossed into the mainstream. It's not. So words mean different things to, right? you know, say the average human being who doesn't work in ac- the academic world. Yeah, and it's actually even worse because um, if you use, you're seen as like arrogant or pompous if you're really particular about words as if they don't matter in, in regular discourse. If you're talking mm-hmm. to somebody and you, you know, and you try to like pin down their claim, just like, do you mean this absolutely? Or just, you know, it's a possibility. The other person's going to get on you for doubting their claim at all without absolutely, you know, even just saying it couldn't, it, it might not be this way. You're not even allowed to do that, to be as particular as possible, to make sure that the claims that you're making are as accurate as possible, mm-hmm. which is what experts do, right? That is not humility. That's not so, so we're back to that, you know, do, do you need to be humble? Absolutely. You have to, because you have to be very careful with your claims. Right. And what that doctor meant by the way, cause they went on and he was just like, basically the mechanism that causes that disease is the, the, the scientists know has to do with the spiral formations of that disease, which aren't a part of the vaccine. So the way it's structured or something. Exactly. So it is, it is literally impossible, Right. But he, what he's saying is, is it possible that someone snuck in a lab and put one of those in the vials? You know, it's just, there's always a possibility of something else. You know, it doesn't mean anything to say probably, especially when you're talking to an expert. Right. In fact, it's a good thing to say that I, I'm he, he was he was 100 percent sure that in terms of that disease, there's no way that that vaccine caused it in terms of a regular vaccine. Right. Unless it was tampered with. Right. But he's still going to say probably because that's humility. That's what humility sounds like. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge problem, you know. And then you got someone like Donald Trump who, again, we can talk about all the different flaws of this person. Right. But I always just go back to intellectual humility and his ability to understand science. So when he starts saying things like, uh, 
you know, windmills cause cancer, the sound from windmills cause cancer. It's just like, how do you knew, know that? Which experts told you that? What was the study? How big was the study? Right. Did and, he really like, did he straight up say that? Yes, I he did. Okay. Well, yeah, word for word. That's what he so said. So there's no, there's no nuance to. No, no, there's absolutely no, no nuance. sarcasm in that statement. Nope. nope. Okay. And he's like, you know, now they say, and that's the big thing that you can go and read his quote, you know, they say that, that, uh, windmills cause cancer. Tell me that one. That's the exact quote. Who's they? They say, who is they? Yeah. You know, and that's down to like not citing your sources. And the, the, I mean, chances are he heard some scientists say it's possible that loud sounds cause cancer and he made the link himself. Yeah. That's I don't, my guess. Yeah. I don't want to take you off the path you're going down right now, but I'm thinking and I'm not defending, you know, his remark for sure. So uh-huh. I'm just get that out there right now. But um, did it stop? No, no, no it's, okay. it's still going. Um the prevailing we're in a position now where people do say provoking things right yeah um and people will often in in a defense after saying something provocative will say oh well that was satire Uh like that's the to get themselves out of trouble or whatever yeah yeah um and so now i'm always skeptical is like is that was really meant by it okay was it satire i don't know because we do know that trump says things yeah. In a joking manner. And I'm always very careful to, mm-hmm. I don't want to spend any time on something that he's being satir- s- right. satir- satirical. satirical about. Thank yeah. you, uh, English professor. <laughs> satirical <laughs> about. Because it takes away from the things that are that he is doing that might right. be significantly damaging. I agree with you. And I think that we get sidetracked by conversations about him where we have to like mm-hmm. read too much into his in- intentions. I hate that when we have to read too much into his intentions. And you see a lot of liberals that will highlight those. I'm like, you are completely detracting from the places where he's actually fucking up. Mm-hmm. That's the only thing you're doing. And you're giving the right. They see that. They're not dumb. Mm-hmm. They're, they see that and they're just like, oh, see, they're, they're, just, they're pulling at straws here, people. Mm-hmm. And they are. Yeah. Um, when it comes to political leadership, um, you know, not necessarily the president, anybody that's in a policy making capacity or, or an elected official, mm-hmm. I don't think you necessarily need to understand. I'm going to get myself in trouble. Understand science in the way that a scientist does. What you need to possess is strong decision making and judgment skills and the ability to analyze information that someone else has like presented you Mm -hmm. in in a reasonable way and you know be able to rely on the information that you're getting and use that information in, in a way that benefits the society that you're trying to shape and you know with it seems like, um, you know, sometimes we have leadership that is either knowingly not, you know, making decisions that Mm -hmm. benefit society for whatever, whatever pressure they're under, whether it's, you know, someone that funds them or whatnot. But, um, you don't need you don't need someone that's a scientist necessarily. You just need someone that can make those strong. Well, not only do you not need a scientist, but it's actually multifaceted because <clears throat> one is you're not going to get the whole truth from one scientist. That's the reality. Uh, you can have the whole picture. Yeah, exactly. You have some. You have people called fringe scientists that largely disagree with the consensus of the community. Uh, and you shouldn't take those people seriously because not, and I was telling my <clears throat> brother about this, this can go and this can kind of roll into all the conspiracy theories. This is, this, this relates to everything that's wrong with our culture right now. Uh, cause he was talking about, uh, Dempsey hustle, Dempsey hustle. I don't know if you've heard of him. You see the one, <clears throat> you see the person that got killed recently? Yes. Yes. The rapper. Right. And you know, my brother was talking about these speculations that it was the government that did it. And the reason that he believes that the government could have done this is because Dempsey Hustle was uh, doing a documentary on a guy named Dr. Seppi. And Dr. Seppi claims to have cured both cancer and HIV. And it basically says it all boils down to mucus, the mucus membrane, right? And he has all this anecdotal evidence. Based on your coughing, you're in trouble. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, man. <coughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting over some stuff myself. Uh, didn't get my vaccine, get so, well soon, so man. That, that's that's on me. You should definitely do that. <laughs> I didn't get. I didn't either. Yeah. yeah. And Sorry. Then, keep going. Yeah. And um, 
Uh, yeah, I don't want to back go too far off, but you listen to the Joe Rogan podcast, and it, it kind of gets worse in some ways because he starts because Joe Rogan is starts alluding to the fact that it's really just a health issue and not a vaccine issue or whatever. It's like this you don't understand. You're like you're you're so wrapped up in your own uh, hubris that you, you can't see that. So again, let's let's go to this. So uh, Doctor Seppi right claims these things, and I finally did the research myself. I'm always disappointed. Uh, yeah, so I'm always disappointed when I do the research on these things because it always ends up being, um, people, uh, not getting all the facts right, or it basically, it always ends up being the narrative that you would expect if you just listened to experts in the first place. That's the idea. And so it's whenever you do it, it's just like, oh, and then they'll have documents that actually show like, that's what went on, you know? So you got people saying that he went before Congress and all these other things that weren't necessarily true. But anyway, the idea is that, uh, if you listen to just French scientists, like you're, you're going to find a geologist who, uh, believes that the earth is 6,000 years old. Right. And it's just like, you know, how, well, he's, he's an expert. Shouldn't you be listening to him? And it's just like, <clears throat> you can have, you can, if you're a smart person, you can probably read, let's say thousands or even tens of thousands of academic papers or scientific papers, right? If you're a smart person, if you're a really smart person, but there are hundreds of thousands and even millions of papers, that's not, a, that's not something one person's going to do and come up with a positive solution for. That's why we have the peer review process because it takes multiple people all looking at a bunch of data that can check each other and say, actually, you missed this over here, mm. or you need to accommodate for this over here. And every time I go down this path, it always just ends up being a huge misunderstanding um, of people who aren't in the community themselves, essentially, you know. Um, and so you, you have to be careful with things like that. And, and Trump has, has uh, demonstrated... Uh, some some deficiencies, some pretty big deficiencies, because you're talking about how um, you don't want to, or you were talking about. I can't remember if, if we got it or not because it cut off. Our our thing didn't work, by the way. We we thought we figured it out, and then uh, it turns out we weren't recording. But uh, going down the path that bear fruit, right? Mm. And I think that's that's okay uh, um, to a certain level. Again, keeping in mind, you aren't going to do all the research yourself. You're, you're just like, you got to get it out of your head. You're not going to. There's so much of it. And, and you can be really mistaken by, by pretending like because you've studied even thousands, let's give a, just a normal person credit, because you studied thousands of papers that now you understand all the things you need to understand about any of the ideas in that field. That is false. That is a fault. That is, that, is, that is hubris. Again, there are hundreds of thousands and millions of papers papers knowledge is a venture that's built by a bunch of people not just a smart few even even the smartest of the few you know you look at a guy like einstein you're like well he's pretty smart he could figure it out he, if you if you research einstein he didn't come up with all those ideas himself you know he, mm. he had some great innovations and he was one of the he was one of the smartest in the field but he still had to listen to other, he still had to take it through the peer review process they still critiqued him right he wasn't just like, well, I'm smarter than all of you. I'm not going to take your critiques, you know, like it, 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 it takes a certain amount of intellectual humility to listen to other people say, you don't have all the facts. You can't do this by yourself. Sorry. Right. This your, 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 your assertion here is over asserted because you didn't accommodate for this section of information over here because you can't read it all, you know, or even, uh, you know, so there's all these conspiracies that you know, well, people don't just want, people just don't want creationists to be right. So there's this, there's this gatekeeping in the field that, that won't allow published creationist papers. And it's just like, no, if you read them, they're not accommodating for all the information. They're ignoring a huge swath of information and you don't get to do that. You don't get to just ignore, or like there's a, there's a, there's a pretty good story about <clears throat> the person who discovered, um, Oh, what's it called? Um, lucid dreaming, right? Mm -hmm. Where you can, right? You can be aware of your dream. And she sent a paper in, <clears throat> I think it was a female, I'm not 100% sure, but they sent a paper in and <clears throat> essentially uh, it got sent back. And it was just like, um, you know, the problem is with your wording and with the stuff, because she had done, she had done um, 
experiments she had done like you know uh, case studies or whatever and they they were like the, the problem is you can't tell the difference between actually being aware that you're sleeping or that being a component of the dream and that sounds semantical that sounds petty right but that's the reality the reality is you could there's a possibility where it's a component of the dream that you're aware that you're dreaming right and and like dream inception yeah something like that like it like you 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 are just it's a part of the dream that you're aware that you're dreaming but you're not actually aware that you're dreaming it's so there confusing. isn't there isn't this reality that you're also aware of that is different from the one you're in currently mm. you're just uh, you're just it's it's a linguistic measure that in your dream you know that you're dreaming right and she didn't complain about it. But you're it. not the, really the conscious agent of the dream. Exactly. Right. You're not the conscious agent that's outside of the dream that has that is aware that there's an outside to be had, right? You're just you're just in your head, you're like, "Oh, I'm dreaming," right? Uh and again, she didn't complain or, or bitch about it. She just redid the study and she did it in a way that accommodated for it, and sure enough, we all believe in lucid dreaming now. You know, no squabbles about it. She just had to do her due diligence where somebody actually asked a good question about her research and she had to answer it. Mm. Uh, and, and, and people don't understand those things, right? They, they want to be right. They want their, in their head to be right. And so you, you can't be, this is what I call, you know, uh, a mental bitch. I've kind of like deemed that. I think that's a real thing where you're a mental bitch. Like you can't take. Oh, I hope that phrase catches on. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. It's, you know, you know, like when someone is a physical bitch, right? Like they're, they're not confident in themselves. And sometimes they lash out at people because they're not physically confident, right? It's the same thing with mental stuff. Somebody challenges you and you can't take that challenge. So you start acting like a mental bitch. You can't take it and you start whining about it and you get angry at them, right? Because you can't take it. Yeah. It's the same thing. To me, it shows a lack of confidence in your own ideas. If you are confident, and your own arguments and your ideas, you would allow any questions that could possibly be forth, be put forth because mm -hmm. you're confident in your idea. You think you've done the due diligence. You've thought of all the reasons you can be wrong, and now you're ready for challenges. And it's important, I mean, because we were talking earlier. We were talking about humility. Now we're talking about confidence. Mm -hmm. Confidence. This is we're not talking about false confidence where you're just yeah. You have this like fake belief. Mm -hmm. And your ego gets the best of you. That confidence is built upon right your research. Yeah, and it is it is subverted under a whole layer of humility. You're always prepared to be wrong, right? But you feel more confident because you've done so much thinking about this topic that you feel like, okay, I'm ready to take on challenges. It's not a position where you still can't be wrong. That's also part of being a mental bitch, where you just can't be wrong, right? Mm -hmm. you, so it's like it's like if you were in a fight with somebody and they punched you in the face and you were like, no, you didn't. Like, what do you mean they didn't? You know what I mean? That That's part of that. Yeah. That, that's part of that kind of mental childishness. Something so something I always feel like I, I need to press on when we're doing these podcasts is you, you or we are sometimes always advocating for um, being more willing to trust people who are most informed about a subject. Yeah. So, and then we're saying we're using the word expert. But not all experts are trustworthy mm -hmm. or are out to benefit right. us as a whole. I mean, because we're we're also um, generally advocating for the well-being of most like ordinary human beings. Right. Okay. So how how does yes. an ordinary person evaluate which expert mm -hmm. they can rely on? Yeah. And who they can. And see, so like right there, that's a good thing to bring into this and and i could have in that moment just been like what do you mean no you always trust experts jay what are you talking about and i could have got yeah. pissed yeah but that would be that would make me a mental bitch right <laughs> okay. rather than just being like that's a reality sometimes science and the academic community they've been part of what we call the intelligentsia and they've dicked people over right but you can assess those on a case-by-case -case basis and really come to a conclusion where you recognize why they happen when they happen so for instance this is a perfect example uh, I don't think either of us necessarily like or are full advocates of the pharmaceutical companies, right? And it's for obvious reasons, mm -hmm. right? But they're experts, right? So shouldn't we just trust them and take whatever they tell us, so on and so forth? Okay, so here's the reality, okay? The reality is they are a section of experts 
pharma people who are work for the pharmaceutical companies aren't the expert body. They are a section of the expert body. The whole field itself with particular incentives. With exactly, and that's where you look at the purpose. What are their purposes, right? Their purposes are highly economical. Which, by the way, you talk about why? Why would we want to create some type of socialist system at all, right? And it's just like. Well, for fields like science, you really don't want those same economic incentives there. You really don't because that's where people start to fudge data or push things that aren't true. You want people that don't have anything on the line, it's at least in terms of economics, right? Because mm. that's just going to be another bias for them to try to exploit, right? Still acknowledging that there are parts of human humanity that will naturally manifest themselves. But So going back to the pharmaceutical company... People who work for some pharmaceutical companies are just an aspect of the whole field of epidemiology, right? So when we talk about the critiques of the, you know, big pharma, so to speak, right? Who do you think those critiques mainly come from in terms of actual data and looking at the figures and being like, here's where you're wrong. Who do you think does that? I'm going to guess other medical experts outside other, of the pharmaceutical industry. Exactly, right? Other experts are doing it. You're not going to be some Google warrior where you take down the system. You, you, have to be, you have to be proficient in the field yourself. You have to understand the history. You have to understand as much of the data as you can. And then you just get a say. That's it. That's what you get. That's what you get for being an expert. You get a say in that community. Mm. You don't get for, to be the ultimate arbiter or authority over that community. There's got to be room, though, for the common man to have a say as well. I mean, because we live in a you democracy in where the common man's vote shapes mm -hmm. the people who do make the greater decisions. <laughs> yeah, well, that's like, how the do problem. We, how do we create the ability? How do we make it easier for them to make, for us, I'm saying them, mm -hmm. really, I mean us, but um, how, do, how do we make that it easier for them to make for us to make the right decisions. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where like my own work has come in in terms of like trying to break things down and make them as simple as possible and still giving the common man really good arguments for why they should trust experts on the whole. Right. Uh, and I've done that. It just, it takes a while to articulate it. It's, it's not necessarily easy, but what you have to do is you have to understand um, epistemology, which is the study of how we can know things. It's mm. the basic fundamental study. So you ha really have to build that list. And then once you've built that list, what you want to do is you want to find out which communities are abiding by that list and which aren't. And that makes it really easy, right? If you, if you look at an expert community and you go like, oh, they're doing all the things I would expect them to do based off of what I know about this world and the way it works to build knowledge accurately, right? Whereas if you look at another community and they're not doing those things, you can be like, mm, wh wh how, are you, how are you getting this, essentially? right? Mm. So, for instance, the first rule on the list that people usually build is if we can observe it, right? If we can observe something, we can be confident it exists, right? That's, that end just ends up being – and there are, compli there are complications with that, but that's just part of the conversation, right? So if you are talking to somebody and they go, I believe X – Right. And you go, where do you get that information? And they don't they're not producing any type of observations or anything like that. You're going to be like, bull crap, Right. It would just be a natural mm. thing to do. But if you're talking to peace, a community, you know, that everybody in the community is concerned with making sure they're making observations. You have another community that isn't concerned with the observations. They're just concerned with making assertions, not putting any data behind it. You're going to be like, I trust the people who are actually making observations, not the ones that aren't. Right. But there are problems with that. So the next one is. Uh, you can see things that aren't necessarily real, right? So, well, how do you get around that issue? You know, just intuitively. And again, this is a conversation that philosophers have had for thousands of years. Again, knowledge isn't created by one person. That's the humility aspect. It's created by a bunch of people, not just a few or one. It's created by a bunch. And that's kind of, you were talking about how how can the common man get on this? The common man can go get a degree. You you Okay. Maybe, maybe they can go get a de degree. Maybe they don't have time. Maybe they don't have money. Right. I mean, we're talking, it's not, it isn't, well, I don't know what the statistics are, so I'll have to be careful with the statement, but I don't know that the common person has a degree. Or, they don't. Okay. So then we're not talking about people with degrees. We're talking about people that have regular jobs yeah. and live a typical nine to five life. Yeah. Um, well, I guess my only point was that they can go get a degree, but I mean, you're right. Not a lot, not a lot of them. It's not practical. To say that, right? Yeah. Which is your point. Yeah, what I'm looking for is a way that the ordinary citizen can make 
uh, we need ordinary citizens to be able to make those sound judgment and decision making skills that I was talking about that our politicians mm-hmm. need to possess when they're consult when they're consulting with experts, whether it's about you know, climate change or you mm-hmm. know dealing with a foreign government, anything. Mm-hmm. Um, these people are the ones we're the ones voting us politicians into leadership positions. So right. We need to create a way. I don't know if it's it's readjusting our education system. Or... It is. Yeah. I mean, one problem is that we don't teach philosophy. And philosophy is where you start to have those conversations about epistemology and how you can mm-hmm. know things, right, and be confident in them. So that's one issue. But I think that the, the answer for me is we need to teach people to be more humble. And we need to give them some basic insight into the infrastructure that really all of academia and, and, and uh, science is built on. It's all built on the same premise. They all have different ways. Once you get past that basic premise, once you get past those basic things, they all have their different methods of building knowledge. But there is a basis that they all follow and abide by that is very intuitive that we could all agree on. It's axiomatic is what we would call axiomatic, meaning anybody can see it and say, oh, I agree with that. And that's what I found. Anytime I ask somebody and I have a conversation about how to build knowledge, we never deviate. We never get off track to where like we don't agree anymore about how to do it. Mm -hmm. And, And what I try to impose on people or tell them is just like this is how academics and scientists are doing their work. So you just agreed with what they did. Now go back and look at some of those other sources you were looking at and ask, is that what they're doing? And I guarantee you the answer is no. I've already done it. You can absolutely. So in terms of figuring out yourself, that's how you would do it. It would be to, it would be, this is how you would actually do it. You would assess arguments on a case by case basis. Okay. And note where the arguments are coming from and use your assessment of those arguments to either increase your confidence in that community or decrease your confidence in that community. Right. And that's really the best way to do it because you're not. So, for instance, a community being a collection of people that have come to a particular conclusion. Yes. And we're trying to evaluate if that conclusion is valid or not. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So. So, for instance, if you um, if you're looking at, let's say, let's say biologists. okay, A, a fundamental premise of biology is evolution. It's the idea of evolution. It's actually the pin in all of it. It makes all of it make sense. Right. And then you look at a creationist community. Right. You can go about it the long way, which which is really impossible. It really is impossible, which is to just study all the literature that's out there on evolution. Yeah. Right. Uh, it, which would just be near impossible for a human brain to do. Right. Or what you can do is you can look at the way that both communities make claims and say, what would I expect given what I know about how knowledge is built and how can that change my confidence in either of these communities? So, again, we, we, we get to that list. I'll just go over some of them right now because I'm kind of like doing all this work now and I, I plan on publishing soon. But um, so the first one is if we can observe it. This, the, the issue with that is we observe things that aren't true, right? We observe things that aren't necessarily, that we're not going to consider real or true, mm-hmm. right? So, well, how do you get around that? You know, how, how, do, how would you say intuitively you would solve that issue? If I'm observing something that isn't real? if No, so you know that it's possible for you to observe things that aren't real, right? Mm-hmm. How do you accommodate for that? How do you make sure or how do you become more confident in the fact that it is real? checking to see if other people are making those observations exactly and that's independent verification see how it just it just comes out naturally we I, we may have talked about this before i can't have we talked about this i think so okay all right but the thing is my it comes brow out. is sweating though because i don't want to get the answer <laughs> wrong no no, no yeah. you don't have to worry everybody goes there so yeah sometimes it takes a second like some people will say like well i would take a picture well what would you do with a picture somebody's eventually goes like well i would show it to somebody independent verification it's natural mm-hmm. it, it it's axiomatic it's, it's something that's built into this universe right and i've also started to this is just a bit off track i'm not going to go down this road but the concept of god and all that yeah I think it it loops back into that and what we mean when we say God, because I think that there are these fundamental premises of the universe that aren't they're not as subjective as other things are. And Mm. and so they are objective in some way, uh, which to me is 
it's an arbiter. It's something that we can hold ourselves to and account for. That if you if you do it a different way, you're just you're bullcrapping. You're you're not following God, so to speak. But anyway, so and then so the other issue is that we can also it's the reverse of the other one. So we can see things that aren't true, right? And we also don't see things. Or we, I'm sorry, I'm using the word see, but we don't observe things that we 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 also believe, right? That's another thing, and it's again mm. something everybody agrees with. Did you see yourself get born? No, but you still believe it, right? Did you see Abraham Lincoln killed? No, you didn't. Do you believe it? Most people are going to say yes, right? So, well, how do you solve that problem, right? And that just ends up being induction. Induction is where you maybe not you don't observe something directly, but you observe a bunch of data around it, and you come to a conclusion. Mm-hmm. This is why Ken Ham's argument was fallacious. And if you would have just known, if you would have thought about this list, you would have seen it immediately because he's like, "Were you there? How do you know evolution happened? Were you there?" Right. And it's just like, no, we're not there for lots of things that we still believe. That's not a good argument. Right. What we really want to do is look for observations. So we're still doing observations. Right. But we're going to use those observations to create a theory of how something actually works or what happened. Right. Sure. And so from but then there there's another issue behind that. And this is kind of where I'll put a pin in it, which is um, uh what we call like the black swan issue so let's say you you were an observer of swans and you just observe swans in north america right Mm -hmm. what might what and so you look at all these swans and all of them are white right white swan white swan white swan white swan what conclusion do you come to about swans that probably that they don't like multiculturalism (laughs) yeah (laughs) no. <laughs> yeah, that's close enough that yeah. there's only white swans that they're all swans are white yeah. right and well what's the problem with that that that's not true it's not true right well how yeah. do you accommodate for that well really you would want to talk to other people who are also observe swans and see what they're observing on the yeah. other side of the globe right mm-hmm. so you've got this observer and that's the peer review process i'm going to look at my data come to conclusions and send it to somebody who's going to tell me what they've seen and tell me why I might not be correct. Mm-hmm. That intellectual humility, right? So you you talk to somebody in Australia and they're like, well, I observe swans and I'm actually observing black swans, right? Oh, well, then I guess swans are black and white or some swans are white or most swans are white. You qualify it. At that Instead point. of being like, can't, that can't be. I've never exactly. seen a black swan. Exactly. Yeah. And just not trusting that person or just being mm-hmm. like, no, I'm right. My observations are what valid and yours are trash. You mm-hmm. don't do that. That's why I tell people when they're getting to an argument with somebody, it's a lot easier to just go ahead and accept their fact, you know, a lot of times and, and see that doesn't mean you don't some, you should still fact check sometimes. But what you want to do first is suppose that their fact is true and see if it even leads to the conclusions that they're saying it leads to, right? So, for instance, uh, instead of, so that person thinks that all swans are black, right? Let's say that that's what they believe, right? Now, you could either dismiss their evidence and say, no, all swans are white. Or you can say, okay, I'm just going to assume that you actually saw black swans. Does that mean all swans are black? It doesn't because I've observed white swans, mm. right? So just go ahead and let there be in- information be true and see if it even still leads to the conclusion that they're saying it does. And what you'll find is that person's going to ignore information. Don't be the person that ignores information. Be the person that accepts information. It kind of takes the two scientists agreeing to each other's findings, right? To yes. help get them closer to the truth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's, that's another issue. The issue is that you end up becoming an expert in your own field. And you trust all of your... All of you, you, you trust all the assumptions that your field has, but the second you step out of that, you start distrusting of their fields. But it's just like they're all built on the same premises. They really are. One of the problems we've been hinting around in this conversation is that like there's not enough time uh-huh. to to really understand what makes a thing true. Yeah. Or like how we come to those conclusions for the ordinary person, right? I mean, it's easier for someone who's going to devote their life to it. But, you know, when you look up a video of an expert in their field, generally they've got gray hair because they've been doing it <laughs> for so long. It's taken them that long to get as close to the truth as they've gotten. Yeah. Um, and we're we're cl- quickly approaching a world where I think computers are going to be able to evaluate all these different papers and studies. They already have. Yeah, if that's not already They've already a done thing. it. They already Google have computer simulations do that, that do this, that have discovered, that have made theories about diseases because yeah. they just didn't put the information and then so is it going to take <clears throat> then to be able to evaluate what's true is it like okay it was the algorithm for that 
hyper intelligent computer trustworthy is it right. evaluating the right information because a person and still do, made that and that person can still be biased so that's going to be you know a liberal yeah. made that you know they're, you're going to go down the because people will wonder about like um alexa you know you ask alexa certain questions uh, and i don't phrase, ask her anything yeah i know i don't either <laughs> but it, it phrases certain things that sound like there's a liberal bias you know uh-huh. uh which is fair oh, enough. interesting yeah 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 uh, again, it's fair enough, and, and you can ask those questions. But uh, join the community first. So we need like a, a redneck Alexa, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to balance it out. Is yeah, that what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, something like that. Or we just need to get better with our own verbiage, right? And and really, there's something again. <clears throat> this isn't to say that the scientific community or expert community is perfect, right? But when I look at communities, and there's one community that's more apt to ignore information. Or they're not peer reviewing their information. They're not making sure that it's independently verifiable. They're using anecdotes. And I see another community that's not doing that. I'm going with the one that's not. I'm going with the one that's making sure their information is peer reviewed. Or has... what's producing benefits to society when we when we start comparing. And that's things. true too, right? But the, I think you're going to get into a religion. What's a benefit? Yeah, religion versus science. Yeah, exactly. Because people who use technology all the time are suddenly going to start to point out all the flaws with it. The second you're starting to doubt them, you know, well, it's done this and that. Okay, I mean, you're saying this on, you're texting me this or you're telling me this online. So it's really strange that you want to kick it under the curb when it's not convenient for you anymore mm. you know, that's again mm, yeah. but the other thing is that in the academic community there's something called bracketing biases and it's, it's a way for people to really look at their biases and try to accommodate for them in some way and again that's not something that's a part of other communities so right there i'm just gonna be like i'm gonna go with the community that has a way that is really trying really trying to accommodate for their biases not the one that seems to be reinforce, reinforcing them at every turn and kissing each other's butts because in order and again this actually this is the whole wrap up for me on the the mental bitchery right mm -hmm. is it's a dog eat dog world in the academic and scientific community you don't go there to have all your ideas reinforced and for people to kiss your ass because that's not what's going to happen you're going to be destroyed and that's a good thing because you have to have all your ideas broken down it's a, it's a you know the whole in the bible the whole you know what is gold will stay you know it's that idea we have to put it through the fire because if we don't we can't be assured that it's any good sometimes it takes an incredibly long amount of time though in the scientific community i mean there are people you you, you use the word destroyed there's people who have been who have come to correct conclusions who have been destroyed in different scientific communities because that has happened it does i mean you're talking about different communities being within themselves a part of a greater community mm -hmm. um those things can become insulated and they protect themselves just like any other like yeah. a religious organization would yeah um from outside threats because uh, I mean, we've talked about this on other podcasts it's just a problem that once you get too deep into a field if your conclusions are wrong you're stuck you, at where yeah. you are and you don't want to give that conclusion up right yeah <clears throat> but that's why there's other people there to check you because they mm -hmm. don't give a fuck about your ideas. Yes. Right. Yeah. Again, this is different from, and this isn't to bash religion at all. I just want to preface that because I, I've, I used to all the time and I really am starting to see the value in narratives that come from religion and how they're helpful to us. Mm -hmm. I, I don't necessarily think they're harmful anymore. I think the way people use them are harmful. I think they can be really helpful, especially to our morality. Um, and in fact, there are a lot of concepts that come from religious cultures that are in the scientific community, specifically because of the connection between philosophy, which heavily involved religion and science, that eventuation of the creation of modern science. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those morals and values are in there, which is great, right? But, <clears throat> um, shit, what was I saying? <laughs> uh, you were talking about how communities can become, I, I had mentioned how communities become insulated mm -hmm. and can be, they can ignore truths as well as other different communities. I mean, and then you were going to comment on that. Right, right. Oh, yeah. So, so, and that's, co that's correct, right? And again, so science and academia isn't perfect. And I've said this multiple times and people seem to get it. You know, it's the best we have. That's what we're saying. And academics don't usually try to claim You're acknowledging the imperfection. Yes. And that's the another thing, right? You're not going to go to church and they're going to be like, the Bible's imperfect. 
they're not going to do uh, in most churches they're not going to do that some will and i really like those like those a universalist church or something like that e- even even more than that i've actually you know there's different sects there's in the catholic there's versions of the catholic church that say this isn't something you're supposed to take fully or, or even jordan peterson you know who considers himself a christian there are different sects of christianity that say obviously this can't be 100 percent accurate word for word obviously mm-hmm. it can't um but um the other thing is like you're you're just less likely to get it. So if you if you go to church, you know, people are gonna kiss your ass as long as you're talking about the same things, right? They're gonna they're gonna say, oh, you're awesome. It's not church isn't about really creating new ideas and testing those ideas and having people say, no, that's not right, right? It's it's more just about reinforcing what you already believe. There's not a lot of reinforcing in the academic community. There's a lot of stuff that's accepted, and okay, where do we go from here? And how do how do we get the new stuff, right? Um, and that's, you know, that's really what it's about. And whenever there's a check, it always comes from that community. You know, it always comes from that community. Whereas I feel like a lot of times in churches, they ended up being dragged. It's not that it's something internal within that community. Yeah. It's that they end up being dragged into the new idea. Well, there's a, I mean, it's just not the same in a scientific community and a, in a religious community, because in a religious community, you know, you might you might go to a church where they they are welcoming about you admitting to and exploring your doubts, yeah, right? Yeah. But if your doubts start to take you away from the religious community, not only are your conclusions about reality changing, your belief systems, but you're you're then in danger of breaking apart like a social fabric in your community yep. that might hold things that are I mean beyond your your beliefs about your worldview. Yeah, are are going to damage the community in some capacity because you're stepping out of it, and maybe that leads to that happening to other people in that community. Right. We both had this experience. I think mm-hmm. uh, it was our problem was that so you, you, our doubts were welcomed, but they were only welcomed to a to certain, certain extent. point. Yeah. And once you pass that point, now we're in a dog fight or whatever, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, and it's not, and and you just you really go into the academic community expecting the dog fight. You're, you're really just prepared for it because you mm-hmm. understand you're trying to fight for your ideas. It's not about kissing each other's ass about what we already know. It's about trying to go from where we know to build new knowledge, right? And there are also there are also attempts to completely revamp the system sometimes, but, but once you reach a certain amount of data, it just becomes less likely that it's going to be incorrect. Um, and that's, that's really uh, the idea, so to speak. That's another thing, you know, people say like, oh, well, you know, science has changed, this and that, you know. It's just like, yeah, well, that's when science was kind of first emerging and we weren't really sure what was going on. Now we have so much data, it it becomes impractical, you know. It's and, always going to change. It's this thing that we we fumble our way forwards in it. Yeah. But there's no clear direction of what it's going to necessarily become. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, there's, there's uh, for instance, and again, this is all coming from the same community. Ugh. Is all coming from the same community. Um, there was a study that was done probably like two or three years ago where they looked at all the psychological papers. Have you seen that? And like a good 90% of them couldn't be replicated, mm-hmm. re-replicated. Mm-hmm. And so all that data... Was that from the same, that same, Har- Ham- same Harris podcast? No. Oh, well, I yes, remember... yes and no. Uh, I had heard it before that. There's another video by, I think, Veracid- Ver- Veracidum or something like that mm-hmm. that also did a video on it. I yeah. show it in my classes. Um but it's the same, you know, and then, but it's just... Okay, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, and then I'll ask the question. And then it's just like, well, you know, who did that study? And it's just like, they did. They wanted to make sure that what they were doing was accurate, right? That's important, mm-hmm. right? So always that double... I'm always going to go with the community that's double-checking themselves at every turn that they can, not with the ones that aren't. Yeah. Okay, so we've been talking about, like, a broad range of a collection of people as, like, the scientific community, right? Uh-huh. And you're advocating that there are... And experts, not just experts. And also recognizing that some of them are more proficient than other ones. Okay. Like, that people argue whether or not econom- economics is a science, right? And my position is, I think we should listen to ec- ec- economic. I think we should listen to economists. Um, mm-hmm. Keeping in mind that it's not as solid of a science as, say, biology. But still... It's a field of study. It is a field of study. And what are the odds that you just know more than them? There's yeah. so much data out there, mm-hmm. you know, which is, you know, where I get on the would, would making healthcare free disrupt our, um, economic system. I don't know. And we should, 
yeah so um i don't know i i don't uh what don't i know jay <laughs> oh son of a trisket um i don't know what are we talking about i was gonna make the point that well the question that i was gonna ask you was Okay, so different scientific communities have, uh, I guess what I want to ask is which, do you think that there's a specific scientific community that is best at evaluating their own experts and does their best at being unbiased towards their own conclusions? I think any, I think the academic community is the best at it. I think any scientists that are working within the academic community with institute within institutions are the best at it, but that's just my opinion. Not a particular, I guess what I'm asking is a particular field that you think does that healthiest. No, no, there's a, there's a huge argument um, that's had with between the communities, between the hard sciences and the soft sciences and the humanities. So the hard sciences are good. There are some, hard scientists that think that the soft sciences aren't even sciences so those are like the social sciences or because you can't sciences. make empirical exactly conclusions you, you can't it's a lot more difficult there's more subjectivity in it essentially which is completely fine by the way as long as you're you qualify your claims properly and that's where my argument comes in but i'm not i'm not too interested in that argument myself but there are hard scientists out there that believe it that believe that we should just completely dismiss the soft sciences uh, for the most part. Um, and I just, I don't believe that. I think that we need to be careful understanding that they're more subjective, right? And we mm. need to be careful about the claims that they make, but that's really where the argument is. Um, so yeah, I think the academic community is better at it. Uh, and, you know, going back to the whole economy thing, you know, I don't, I don't know what would disrupt. I also, so the reason that it's just like, well, then why would you do this or that? Why would you vote for? So for instance, I might end up voting for Bernie Sanders again. I don't know yet at this point. If it gets that far. <clears throat> yeah. My hope was that what he would he would get in there and be humble and listen to economists and be like, this isn't practical, this is practical, so on and so forth. Um, maybe that happens, maybe it doesn't. But my argument against that is, one, he still listens to the scientific community as a whole. You know, he's doing that way better than Trump is. I, I, bet, I, I would bet you bottom dollar, uh, again, science being our best way to understand knowledge, that Trump is going to have way worse long-term ramifications mm -hmm. uh even if it's better in the short term than somebody like bernie sanders would because he's still going to be listening to environmentalists right he's gonna be listening to those people who are looking at long-term trends um and then the other thing is we're already we're already i don't i don't even think trump listens to economists i don't think he's up there listening to, uh, in terms of the, just from what i've heard about him and the fact that like he dismisses certain experts even you know like i've heard i've heard people say that as well that he he won't listen to this or that economic advisor or this or that advisor right um and we're already spending money on things that also aren't proven to be good economically we're already doing that we're already doing it on war. There's a bunch of economists didn't get together and decide, hey, if we got into this war, it would be economically beneficial for us in the long run. That didn't happen. That didn't happen. We still spent a lot of money on it. So we're already doing it. Oh, war is ec economically beneficial for some people. Right, exactly. And, you know. Yeah. Uh, that's Iraq why you need, is a good example of that. That's why you wanna... need economists that are working with uh, a, a bunch of them, right? A bunch of economists working with academic institutions that can have our back on this and say, you need to listen to all of us, not just a few of us, but r really the president should be I don't understand how nobody has figured this out yet, but the president should be getting the best people in the world all together and be saying like, he should really just be like, okay, what should I do? You guys are the experts. That's what his cabinets are for. I mean, each department, but they're just in, they end up just being people that are in those positions mm -hmm. because of their status not mm -hmm. because they're actually the best in their field even sometimes. Yeah, it's often I I'm going to be careful about saying this cuz I don't know too much about it, but um my understanding that is a lot of um individuals who end up ambassadors for different countries as representatives, you know, from the United States mm -hmm. are often um individuals who are mega donors for Yeah. You know, someone who you know who wins the presidency and that's not just something that trump has done that's 
that's been kind mm-hmm. of a consistent thing Absolutely. for a while now. Um, uh, my understanding is Obama did the same thing. Yep, he did. Um, okay, and so instead of putting someone who understands really the intricacies and the culture of a particular country, yeah. you just have someone who basically bought the position. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously that's going to lead to ramifications for our relationship with that country or benefiting the people in that country or our own. Um, yeah, I mean, so the, the mechanisms are in place to have those experts in position, mm-hmm. right? Like that exists. Yeah. But who's putting, whoever's making the decision, the executive, to put individuals in those positions are not choosing the individuals who maybe ought to be in that position. Yeah, yeah. And that goes back to money and politics, right? Yeah. And it's, it's like... Um, I think that we just, I think we're starting to have a conversation about all our real issues, but we just haven't done it effectively yet. And that's why we have Trump. Um, Because people have started to recognize like, oh, there's an issue in politics. And for some reason, he was good enough at convincing people that he was on their side. Mm. And clearly he's not. Um, And I think that that's, that's the real issue. But people are recognizing, you know, and it's just like, the problem is that there's too much incentive in politics. There's way too much money in politics. So the incentives are wrong, essentially. And we have to, we have to change that. And there were candidates who were willing to do that, but we didn't vote for them. You know, Bernie Sanders talked about that. Uh, Whoever was the head of the Green Party talked about that as well. And we have candidates this time talking about it, you know. Um, And if you, if you want those incentives to change, you're going to need somebody who, who's going to do that essentially. Mm-hmm. And, and it's, it's their platform. So you can hold them accountable because you're like, well, there's no guarantee they're going to do it. You come up with these really bad arguments. Like, well, there's no guarantee. No, but if they have it as their platform, that's better than somebody who doesn't even have it on their platform. That's better. You at least want it on their platform. Uh, and you know, things like that. So yeah, I just, uh, you know, I think it all comes down to the expert community and kind of our the disconnect between the common person and there has to be a buy-in i guess is what we're, we're driving out is like the, so, the the population has to be able to buy in to what experts are saying so right. like a, just an easy example is like climate change we're yeah. not doing anything about it and we haven't done anything about it because we were watching videos about this stuff when we were like in elementary school mm-hmm. you know more than 20 years ago yeah we were being told as students this is going to happen. These are changes that are going to happen in our environment if we continue to behave this way as a society. Yeah. Um, and the reason there hasn't been more major actionable steps towards mitigating those problems that we understood back then is because the average citizen is not buying in to that. Yep. So we need buy in. And that's what we were kind of like alluding to earlier in the podcast. And, I, and I'm just. I don't have the answer necessarily for how we create that buy-in, but that has to exist before we can get some of the changes that we're talking about. Yeah. And maybe that's starting to happen. I hope that our generation has that buy-in. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I'd seen a statistic yesterday that was saying that generationally we have, we vote more than other generations in the past. Like in favor of? Just we're, we're more involved. Oh. So there's more more buy-in. As a young popul as a as a young gener I'm I'm gonna mess this up. Okay. Well because I thought I thought we voted the least. I thought we were least likely to vote. The millennials? Yeah. I think we're more likely to vote. Oh we are? Yeah. Then how is I this could sh- be wrong about that, so okay. don't hold me to that. I know I think we're more likely to agree with scientists on scientific topics. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I don't know if we're more likely to vote. I think that's the issue is getting younger people to vote always has been the issue mm-hmm. could or maybe we're just more politically i think because i know the statistic i think that you're talking about is i think we're more possibly more politically active and that doesn't mean we necessarily vote more right because a lot of people still don't see the point right um which you know i don't necessarily agree with but i i think that uh i think it is simple i think it's just you learn you, you study some philosophy and you learn those basic fundamentals that every academic or scientist is held accountable to. And then you you use that as your gauge. Oh, well, they're doing that? Well, then they must be doing something right. It's a game of cat and mouse, too. I mean, by the time the the population does buy in, in, into an idea, right, and they figure out what's going on, mm-hmm. we as a society figure out what's going on, 
um, and we react to whatever information we've just learned, yeah, the rules get changed on us again. Yeah. And so it takes, we just, you start that process over again until we identify what that new problem is that, 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 that loophole that's being used to engineer our own decision making. Yeah. Well, that's why I like my idea because my idea is fun. It's fundamental to all of it. It just takes care of all of it because it's fundamental to the way we build knowledge. Mm -hmm. That's our issues. We don't have that platform by which we can all agree. This is the best way to build knowledge. And then which communities are doing this and which communities aren't. It's that simple at that point. It really is simple. I'm not trying to like, it's, that's not that complex. Um, if, if we have that list and you're looking at communities and they're not doing what that what's on that list that you agreed was the way to do it, then you should, you shouldn't trust that community that's not doing it. And you should trust the communities that are doing it. Um, and so I, I think that's the loose solution for that to, to where we can all get on the same page. Okay. We really just need to listen to experts. We really just need to, because as long as they're abiding by these things, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and then the other thing is, there's gatekeeping going on here, too, uh, which is... Can I rant about that phrase for a second? Gatekeeping? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. It's becoming a neg negative connotation. I used to really like the phrase gatekeeping, mm -hmm. because my perception of that phrase before it's gotten popular was it was about being a... Oh, shit. Being a guardian for good ideas yeah gatekeeping what should be protected and what should be prevented from you know ruining a good thing almost but now gatekeeping is about something else it has a, to me it has a negative connotation that i don't like gatekeeping is a it's a negotiation in the academic community so i guess one of those there's there's nothing that's pure you know, not even gatekeeping. So what are the issues with gatekeeping? Well, you end up keeping a lot of people out and then they don't understand that thing. And then if they ever have to make a decision about that thing, they're not prepared because they're not a part of the community. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's a problem with gatekeeping. The, the good part is the part you just said is that it helps, it helps you set a standard by which everybody has to meet so that you can keep that community rigorous. You can keep the methods and ideologies in that, in that community rigorous essentially you can check them and make sure they're good right if you just let everybody in you let any ideas in it doesn't work right um but the problem is that gatekeeping clearly uh is it has a lot to do with the race economic status those things that and so prior to world war ii a very small percentage of people actually even went to college that's a high amount of gatekeeping you had to be privileged to get into college right you had to be now, then, then you have to answer the question, do you think that privileged people are all smarter than non-privileged people? And um, a lot of academics said, no, we don't think that. We don't think that's what separates intelligence from non-intelligence. There's got to be more than that. Mm. Just because you have more money doesn't mean that you're smarter. Obviously, just because you have more money doesn't mean you're smarter, right? So we got to find a way to break that barrier down. And that's what's been going on. So they're always trying to maintain the barrier while pushing it back, allowing more and more people in while still making sure to maintain intellectual integrity. And that's been the conversation. So it's a good and bad thing. It's not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah. Uh, but the problem with it is, like you said, if you want everybody to be in a democracy to be making good choices, but they're not a part of that community and they don't understand it, that's probably bad for the community because everybody's voting about what happens within that community. So you need now. So imagine you want to take one. away voting rights of certain people. I do, but that's a different conversation. Oh, man. That's a different conversation. We absolutely. should do a whole episode on that. We can. I, I absolutely think you should. I think that I think that we need to start to think about what's better for the whole, and not what's better for the individual. Sometimes right? I can see someone writing an article on you about daily, on Daily Beast now. People, this guy the, wants to take all, away I'm not the, the person to. I'm not the first person to do this. Yeah, but you're easy to attack because uh, you only get they're not 30 even, views. I'm not even going to register <laughs> on their radar. If, if I get, yet. If, I, if I get an article, give it another five years, man. I, I hope so. Track that sentence down. I have. I hope so. I hope so because I'll stand by it at the, at the time. You know, yeah. I, I might feel different at the time, but yeah. for for this context and me now, yeah, absolutely stand behind it. Um. Nobody thinks everybody should vote, first of all. So how can other make it get on me? You don't think everybody should vote. Yeah, I don't think 16-year-olds should you, vote. You also don't believe that people who are incarcerated should vote, right? Currently. Currently. 
Yeah. Right. But I do think after you've, I think so too. Gotten back into society, you've right. paid for your punishment. You've done your punishment. Yeah. And so I don't like the idea that your punishment continues to linger yeah. after you've served your sentence. I agree with you on that. Absolutely, I agree with on you. Agree, agree with you on that. But I don't I think like capacity for redemption. I do too, and I don't. I don't think. Uh, but I just don't believe that anybody has a right to fuck up society because you want uh, your say, so to speak. You don't have a right to impose your ignorance on other people, which is what you do when you vote as an ignorant person. You impose your ignorance on the rest of the nation. Mm-hmm. You do not have that right. Why should you have that right? You don't. The, the individual is not more important than the whole. Dude, I want to do that. I want to do that. Pod. This is going to be a good one. I'm excited <laughs> about this one. Uh, but yeah, so to, so to wrap up this one, you know, it, it's um, imagine imagine a community where you have you have you have a biologist in your family. Your your best friend is a psychologist. Uh, your neighbor, who you're really good friends with is a sociologist so on so forth you're just you might not be a part of the community yourself but a lot of people that you trust are in those communities mm. now what do you now how does that affect your decision making when you go to, you're gonna be like well i know all these people they're they're close to me right the problem is that it hasn't happened yet you have these you have a lot of people who aren't they don't know anybody from these communities or they know very few people from these communities right well you tend to associate with people who are like you Generally, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, they're psychologists hang out with psychologists, right? And that's gatekeeping. Mechanics too. hang out with mechanics. That's also and, part, but those, are, but they also have families too. They hang out with their families. Their families yeah. aren't necessarily mechanics, right? They have friends that aren't necessarily com- mechanics, mm-hmm. right? So it's true on one level and not true on the other, right? And the whole point is that um, that that comes from gatekeeping where you don't know anybody in that community because you, because that community hangs out among each other mm-hmm. and not, not outside, right? So that's also gatekeeping. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, I mean, that happens a lot, right? Your, your parent was a psychologist, so you become a psychologist, you know, uh, and we need, we need more people to be a part of these communities, which is funny because you, then you're told, well, nobody needs college, you know, some people, which is on some level true. Uh, on some level, it's true. <laughs> just like shaking my head thinking about school <laughs> that's why he yeah. left yeah um but you need people to understand them maybe we yeah. should do it earlier we should be embedding people in these communities when they're in high school so that they don't have to worry about college what you certainly don't want are people who have been mecha- who who end up just going into the mechanical field that want to make decisions about psychology that's awful it's an awful system for doing that why would you have that system that's the system we have we have a system where people do eight hours of work a day in a labor job and then want to make decisions. They want to put somebody in power that is supposed to understand things about these other scientific communities or academic communities. And they don't. And that's how you get somebody like Trump that says a two year old goes in to get a vaccination and then a week later is autistic. And he doesn't understand that that's that's that doesn't mean shit. Mm-hmm. That's not evidence for anything at all. It's, it's one it's it's one data point where he should have another 300 500 data points mm-hmm. all across the world now we have those data points and they don't show anything by the way but that's how you get statements like that and that's how you get people who don't even, that that doesn't even come up in conversation if we're going to talk about trump and the negatives and positives of trump trump that that tweet doesn't even come up in conversation that is amazing yeah, that's that's it's baffling to me. I don't understand it. We, we you know, and this isn't to get on. I'm not saying that like, you know, we can talk about Russia. Right. We can talk about um, even immigration. You know, we can talk about those things. Those things are obviously important to talk about. Right. But in terms of like high priority, I don't understand why we're not nailing him on the things that it's proven. He's just um, stupid, for a lack of a better word, in talking about that subject. Anybody who understands correlation causation is going to say that's not evidence of dick at all. Hmm. Or it was cold today in New York, so global warming isn't real, right? And to really have a conversation around that, him saying that and being like, hmm, maybe this guy is not the best at thinking around these topics, you know? But we end up talking about these other, we end up getting sidetracked with, you know, who he's paying off or if he had a love affair with this or that person, you know? The left is really bad at 
mm-hmm. picking their battles. Yeah, very bad. And it, everything it, outrages them. Everything outrages them, and that's the problem. You gotta you gotta prioritize your outrage. And you should be out, outraged by things that should induce outrage. I think. Yeah. You know, that's very subjective, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah People that's true. can be sensitive about different kinds of things, but uh, they 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 tend to pick battles that detract away from you know the the important things that they're trying to to get at. Absolutely. They defend the wrong things. And that gives the other side. Like when I talk to people about the tweets that he made, there's not a conversation afterwards because I'm right. And, but when you hear other left person bring up Trump, you'll get that rebuttal. And it's because they're not picking the strongest battle. They're picking the weak battle. The other person's like, oh, that's not true. Or this, you didn't accommodate for this. And sometimes they're right, you know, rather than just being like, look, the dude said that a two-year-old went in and got a vaccine and a week later got autism, therefore vaccines cause autism. That it doesn't matter who you are, what political stance you have, that is a dumb statement. Doesn't matter. And that's why I found when I say that, I, you know, I've said it to lots of conservatives, the conversation's over at that point. We're not even talking about it anymore, mm. right? It's just them going away. And the result of that conversation is that, is that if he is saying those kinds of things in that in that one area, his conclusions about other things and can other often areas. be is invalid. Right. And that's the problem with yes. the person that we're particularly talking about. Yes, is he exactly. makes a lot of those statements. Yes, he may, and he, has, he clearly has poor judgment. Many of them are not satire, like that we were talking about at the beginning of the podcast. Exactly. He was not being He a, means that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He wasn't joking when he said that. And so and, and you're being fair at that point. It's just like he, he meant it when he said it. It is absolutely fallacious no argument after that that's just the end of the conversation right and you know one way the conversation can go after that is well you know some people think that vaccines cause and that's that that has actually happened where i'll tell tell someone that you know i'll say he you know he i'll give them his quote and they'll say well some people think that vaccines do cause autism you've completely lost the point now we're not talking about autism we're talking about his argument his argument is shit We're not talking about whether or not vaccines cause autism. We're talking about the conclusion, vaccines cause autism. Why do you believe that? Because a two-year-old went in and got a vaccine and then a week later had autism. Therefore, vaccines cause autism. No, that's not. There's more to that story. There's not a legitimate connection there. Sorry. That's not how logic works, Mm -hmm. right? So we're not talking, you know, they can try to try to. And then once you go there, again, I've just found people don't talk. There's nothing to talk about. It's a bad argument. Then he, and, and. you know, I mean, to be fair, every politician does it too, but he does it to an extreme level. He continues to. Yeah, do that's the thing. This, I mean, I, I was going to say, I don't want to continue to talk about Trump. I think it's better if we just ignore that name. But he, in truth, my opinion is that he's not doing anything all that different from any other politician that's come along. Yeah. He just can be a little bit more ugly in nature the way he speaks. I think, I think he's way that, worse when it comes to science, but, and that, that makes people more aware of what he's doing. Mm. But I think plenty of other politicians that have come along in the past have had similar behaviors and thought processes as him. Yeah. They're just better about making it look pretty. Some people. Yeah. Yeah. Some people, but it's just like, so for instance, Hillary Clinton uses fallacies, but she's more likely to prevaricate which is like she's more likely to avoid she's more likely to use like a non sequitur which is more likely to to avoid the topic than to make a claim that's fucked up <laughs> that's the difference i would rather have somebody that I, I i i do believe that hillary clinton knows how to make claims on some level i, I think she does understand the scientific community on some level um uh Whereas I don't think Trump does. And I would prefer to have somebody who understands how claims work and how to make them than someone that doesn't. But continue to be deceptive? It's still better. So, so again, this and this is my whole uh, Joker versus Two-Face analogy. Who would you prefer to be the mayor of your city, Joker or Two-Face? And if you say Joker, you're really not thinking about all the damage that guy could cause. That'd be a good episode, too. Joker versus Two-Face? Yeah, as, as politician. Yeah, That'd yeah. Good Whereas Hillary Clinton is Two Face. She Hillary Clinton understands the law like Two Face. Two Face is he's co- he's she's coherent in mind. She's just playing a game, mm-hmm. right? So she is deceptive. She's immoral, but she's not stupid. 
Whereas to me, Trump is both immoral and stupid. So I'm going to go with Two-Face. I'm just, you know, I'm going to go with that one, not Joker. I don't want Joker. And the idea is, well, if Joker burns everything down, that we can build everything up. But I don't think you think about how, what that really looks like in fruition. What it really, because it's just like, we're going to vote for a president in another four years. You know, if we don't like the way that Hillary is running things, we can get rid of her too. Sure. We can try to, right? You don't think about the amount of damage that a crazy person can cause. Let's do, let's for real do that podcast. Okay. I think we can have a, some good philosophical. Yeah. We can pull out some cool stuff on that. I'm, I'm cool with that. Sweet. Well, is that it for this one? Yeah. I feel like uh, we've had a good conversation here. Great. Great. So you can expect more of these. We're going to try to do these every Sunday reliably now. Uh, so, you know, if womp, you... womp. <laughs> yeah. And so, and we plan on kind of like, kind of working more towards all this so we we're gonna have a new logo coming out soon and uh well lots of shit lots of shit's gonna be coming we're thinking about making a patreon page thinking about it we're not sure we but, think about a lot of stuff yeah yeah but the point is you know if you if you for me the reason that this is important is because people say that they want more balance right and we're trying to do that we're, we're tr- as much as we sat here and harped on Trump, we've had a Trump supporter on the show before, and we will likely have another one in the future because we want. We're willing to acknowledge when he does something that's yes, that's decent good. when it occurs. Exactly right, and we can we can absolutely do that. Um, and so, uh, I think I would distinguish us from somebody like Dave Rubin, who does that too. Even though to me, he ends up agreeing with his guests, whereas we're not going to be afraid to say like. Maybe this thing, you know. I think if someone listened to our podcast, they'd probably come to the conclusion that we're... It's like so far, based on all the episodes we've had, that we're probably super liberal people. Yeah. But I think as we get further down the road, they'll start realizing that we're not only... Yeah. We don't have only progressive ideas. Definitely. Just we're waiting for a topic to come up that makes sense for us to talk about. It'll reveal that. Exactly. Trump's just kind of like the topic of the the day right now because of who he is. And the reality is... uh, I know people are talking, I mean, I even I said that I'm tired of talking about him, but he is worth talking about. This is unique yeah. in our history. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's worth like trying to pull apart as a person and figure out what your role is in, in this environment that we find ourselves in. Yeah. And I don't know if we add any more to the conversation or we're just noise in all of it, but I'd like to think it's it's useful because we're trying to be trying our best to be reasonable about what we think yeah instead of being reactionary yeah yeah that's the key right if, if you want somebody that's not going to react to things that's gonna basically my, my goal is to cut past all the bullshit we don't get emotional right right and to, and to cut past those those stories that we have to assume something about a certain person in order to continue the conversation right i hate those where it's just like i have to assume 20 things before what you're saying becomes legitimate and I really want to cut past all that bull crap where we're not we're not talking about topics where we have to get inside of say Trump's head so that we can talk about how shitty he is. I would rather just have the conversations where we know what he's said or done and talk about how shitty he is mm. based off of that, mm-hmm. you know, or anybody, you know, again, talking about Hillary or or even Bernie, you know, I could talk about him too. You know, it's nobody's off limits essentially. And for me, it's having that standard. You, what you do is you sit, make a list of all your standards and you make sure everybody abides by that list. It doesn't matter who you are. You're not off limits. If you violate something on that list, you, you, you're you going to get disagreement. Yeah. Period. So. Cool. You want to shut her down? Yeah, sure. But be sure to like or comment. We need that. So yeah. we need to start asking for more feedback. We should probably do this at the beginning of the Feel podcast. Feel free to chew us out. Absolutely. So any and every idea that you have. Uh, Just don't call me mean names. I can be sensitive sometimes. <laughs> on, on Sundays, too, I'll try to, if anything happens, I'll, I'll, I'll respond back. So if you're also looking yeah. for responding back, we have time for that, too. So, all right, guys. Uh, have a nice Sunday. Yep. All right, guys. Bye.